we're pleased to welcome back Dr. Alan Goldstein, who's a uh, professor of biomaterials at Alpha University. We're really uh, taking off from where we left off. I, I've watched our video interview, which is uh, available on demand at our website, several times. And uh, I always said to myself, why we got to the point we did in the program, we had to set it up. And, and, and just at that point, we had to stop. Where we were is we were, uh, we, you had set up for us what it is or how, uh, let's call these animated robots, do their job by communicating with cells around them. And that's when we stopped. And I think that is, right. th that is a, a critical point because you see some dangers there. And, I, and again, I've got to set this up to why we're not just doing a program on science here. In San Francisco, we're finding that we will be one of the world centers for nanotechnology. Correct. And the dangers that you're warning about <coughs> apply directly to the citizens of the Bay Area. So uh, uh, just so that people understand why you're here and why we're talking about this, it's an exciting industry. So let's, let's pick up where we, we, we took off. Uh, in, in, in sum, what is it that they ideally would like to see these little animated robots do in our bodies and in, in other? Right, I'll be happy to pick up there. Yeah. So the first concept, well, before I start, let me say these are my opinions that are not the opinions of Alfred University. Absolutely. And the next thing I would like to say is that they're not robots. They're not nanobots. And this is the key. And perhaps if I can explain to you, perhaps if we use the term molecular engineering instead of nanotechnology, it might become more clear because what this revolution is about is about our ability to build with molecules and to build molecules exactly the way we want them and position them exactly the way we want them. So these molecular devices are no more robots really once they're up and running than we're, molec than we're robots because we are animated by molecules that go particular places, do particular things, send chemical signals, send electrical signals. So if we can build other devices, entities made of molecules that can go places in our body, send particular chemical signals, then why aren't they robots anymore? They're not really robots. The difference is though, I or tell me if there's a difference. There's a, a thing called telos or teleology where you know there's a certain function of cells or, or, or creatures to pursue survival and so on, all the different functions to exist, to, to fight, to f flee, to do all those things. Mm -hmm. You're not suggesting that these molecular elements or creatures that we could create would have the same kind of survival uh, instinct or ability. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. In other words, Bertrand Russell used the term chemical imperialism. That's a beautiful term because if you think about it, what are we? We are really the end product of some type of chemical intelligence on the part of carbon. We are carbon's chemical imperialism. Now, we are about to unleash through nanotechnology or molecular engineering other forms of chemistry that, once they are released, may in fact, based on their own chemical intelligence, do things that we did not intend them to do. That's they may not be able to stand up and run away yet, but remember, we're just the sum total. We'll look at it a different way. A prion is just a single molecule, yet look at what happened in this country when we thought a single molecule, a single protein, had gotten loose in our meat supply. There was panic. Well, is that prion intelligent? It has a certain, I'll answer, you know, you don't ask a question if you don't have the answer. It has a form of chemical intelligence. It has a way to find its host in a chemical sort of way. It has a way to target its host, and it has a way to reproduce. So even single molecules have a certain form of chemical intelligence. And nanotechnology, which I'm now calling molecular engineering because it's a more descriptive term, mm -hmm. Molecular engineering is about building molecules, designing them to interact to a large extent with us. Intentionally for the sake of health to uh, 
part of medicine, medical treatment, part of the whatever, re rebuilding the body, uh, various functions we would like, we as human beings would like to see the, these, these elements do. This that, that's what the good guys and gals are working on, and most people justify their research based on great causes, curing disease, you know, extending life. But every one of those is, a, is at least a dual use. Okay, weapon. well there's two different dual uses. One is where the, the bad guys get a hold of this technology and can do bad things with it. And, but the one that's more intriguing I want to spend more time on is where the, the unintended consequences of what we're doing, our own doing, without any terrorists or outside sources, that they would, uh, they would go on their own and do mm -hmm. damage or, s or what was not intended. How, how, how does your industry, how does your science intend to deal with controlling the function of what you're creating? At the present time, we don't have a clue. We do not have a clue, and this is the thing that worries me uh, more than anything else. People are operating under the assumption that <coughs> nano safety is a count. If we just take bio safety and chemical safety and add them together, the sum will be nano safety. But that is not correct. Let me give you an example. Right now, we're designing molecular devices as therapies, right, as therapeutic agents that will circulate through our bloodstream and use the glucose in our blood to power themselves, just like we use glucose. We use so they'll have little glucose motors, glucose-driven motors. Now, they will also be programmed to recognize certain cells and perhaps enter those cells and do certain things to cure a specific disease. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I get inoculated with that nano system. And then later on, I get treated with another molecular device that is going to do something much more radical to me, but is only supposed to live in my system for a couple of days. But since both of these devices speak the language of the body, hmm. they may get together and exchange information. So the device that was only supposed to live for a day or two might cross, might exchange information, might grab a piece of, might grab that glucose battery from the other molecular device. And suddenly, a molecular device that was supposed to live or a molecular entity that was only supposed to be in my body for a day or two has a glucose battery on it and it can stay there for as long and as I'm alive. How can your colleagues not recognize the inherent dangers, most of them unimagined, of the technology you're talking about. Because they're engineers, and engineers mainly are trained to solve problems. And when you are inside of this environment, if you're working on curing heart disease, if you're working on curing Alzheimer's, you don't question that. You say, of course people want their heart fixed. Of course they don't want Alzheimer's, or they want, they want to cure people with Alzheimer's. So. Nanoscientists and nanoengineers are not trained. They don't have the mindset to question what they're doing. And yet, they are building devices, they are building molecular entities that must, by definition, be able to speak the language of the cell. Yes. I mean, I'm talking to you now because neurons in my brain are sending electrical and chemical signals that ultimately result in speech. But if you break it down, every one of those signals is either an electric impulse or the change in concentration of some chemical compound. So in the end, anything that can do that can potentially modify my behavior, your behavior, the way we live, or the way we don't live. I'll give you a really scary example because I, I try to think of these not because I'm an alarmist, but because very few scientists who work in this field are willing to talk about the dangers. So sadly, I have to be a bit strident to try to get people's attention. Uh, the National Research Council published its triennial, triennial review of the National Nanotechnology Initiative. That's our national program. The section on safety was almost non-existent. And it's 
a publicly available report. People can read it. Uh, the unforeseen is really not considered. Well, let me ask you this. We do have a parallel situation with uh, biotechnology and, and, the, and the formation of new drugs. Mm -hmm. They must go through an extensive review process with the government, with the FDA. They must be tested before they're certified. How will the government deal with these molecular devices? They're obviously going to have to be regulated. How will they test them and how long do they test them and in what circumstances do they test them because they can constantly become something else or join with other cells and, and do unintended consequences. How does the government begin to approve them? Once again, in my opinion, Art, we don't have a clue. The FDA is a wonderful agency. They try the best they can. But if you actually look at the number of people, if you look at their budget, they're tiny. And they know this tidal wave is coming down the road. They form what they call an, an office of combinatorial products, things that are part biotech, things that are part nanotech. But in reality, they don't know what to do about it. But and again, I, I don't want to be too negative because we're coming to the end of the program almost to the opposite end of where we left the last one. You do see promise. You do see value. You do see revolution here uh, uh, that's potentially positive as well. The, the next industrial revolution will be the molecular manufacturing revolution. You know, of course, that, that may be at the industry level. It could be in, in terms of all kinds of other things. But in terms of the body and medicine, in terms of what can affect human beings and their bodies and their environment, um, you're still somewhat positive about the overall positive effect on society. I think that if, if the community gets together and addresses this issue seriously, now we can prevent a catastrophe further down and the road. How, how do you go about doing that based on what you've described these devices to be? That is, that they're capable of communicating, uniting, uh, pursuing, making their own decisions almost. Well, it, how, it do you, how does your industry then go about self-disciplining itself? If, if you look at the National Cancer Institute's website, they will talk about nanomedical devices that are coming in the next 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years that can read your DNA sequence before delivering the therapy. Now, it's not a big step from that to talking about bioweapons that read your DNA sequence before they release their toxin. So maybe the DNA sequence that classifies you as a certain ethnic group, right? So we have to start off by acknowledging these dual-use potentials, and then we say, okay, what are the foreseen consequences? What are the unforeseen consequences? And how do we set up safety guidelines to address both what we can predict and to ensure to the best of our ability that we try to protect society from what we can't predict? And final question, though, I know we only have just a few seconds. Do you believe you'll be successful in self-disciplining this new science to the point that, that uh, it will be uh, the promises and the, the will, will outweigh the, the dangers Unless the community changes its approach, the answer is no. All right. On that pleasant note, Dr. Gunstein, thanks again for being with us. Hey, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Visit our website at www.sfunscripted.com.